how international are you yourself, uh, Solveig? Uh, could you tell us a little bit about your background and what you actually do at Signals? Yes. Um, thank you so much for uh, the invitation. Uh, good morning to everyone. Um, my name is Arvaik. I'm co-lead and director from Signals, the innovation ecosystem from Signal Iduna. We um, at Signal Iduna aren't as international, I would say, as I wished for yet. Um, personally, I'm a little bit more international, I would say. Um, I co-founded uh, Lufthansa Innovation Hub in um, 2014, where we opened up our first um, branch in Singapore. And this was one of my last projects before I thought I need to go on new um, adventures. And I also um, originally um, studied politics, and uh, I all did that um, abroad and not in Germany. Yeah. Smart move probably to leave the airline industry just before. Uh, but but okay. I did it before. Yeah, you did it, yeah. you did it before. <laughs> so, um, Mr. Zau Essig, you're a member of the executive board of SAP, um, uh, responsible for SAP project engineering. Uh, okay, well, on a daily basis, what do you exactly do then? That's a good, that's a good question. Does it work? Yeah. yeah. So basically, I'm responsible for all applications SAP is selling to the customers and to run them in the cloud, for sure. And with that regards, for sure, it's uh, extremely international. Our entire development is uh, organized in labs. Uh, you mentioned Klaas Neumann, the head of our global lab network, who's chairman here of this Asia-Pacific week. And, and for us, it's super important to leverage the global skill sets. Personally, um, the first time I've been to Asia was at the age of 22. Yeah. And quite frankly, I was extremely fascinated to see actually the speed of, of how the things are driven in Asia, yes. that certainly was one of the key things. And then also personally, I did some international studies abroad uh, in the US, in Asia, in Singapore and Shanghai. So certainly it was um, leaving a dent in my, in my character to really have an open mind uh, about diversity and inclusion. Okay, cool. Can everybody understand what Mr. Sao Essig is, is, uh, is saying? Or is it should be a little bit louder maybe? Yeah, yeah, it should be. A, if you talk in a microphone like this, then, then probably it, it will help. But at the age of 22, so uh, uh, how long is that ago, if I may ask? <laughs> That's 13 years ago. Yeah. 13. Okay, so you're now 35. And when you now come there in your new uh, uh, function, um, it's still the speed, right? That, or is there something else that, that now catches your eye? I, I think if you go to, to Bangalore the first time I've been there, they still had the old airport, and now for sure it's the new, which is totally different. And if Wrong you example. Do, you cannot do this in Berlin. This is, uh, that's this true. Is, uh, yeah. We'll never see a new airport in Berlin. But, uh, but um, also think about Shanghai. Always, even if you visit Shanghai in three months, in one quarter, the city is totally different. You see that right away. And this is, yeah. this is so fascinating. And this speed is something which is ingrained in the DNA of everybody. Yes. They want to move the things ahead. And this is where we as a company for sure want to participate. Yeah. We want to learn from that. And like I just did a joke before, I mean, um, if you go here with a, with a taxi, you most probably you know, pay with a credit card. If you are in Shanghai, you will not find any taxi driver which accepts credit card anymore because you use WeChat or, or Alipay, which means it's so different from an innovation perspective and from an openness perspective of the people how to embrace innovation. And this is something we only can learn from. And I hope that we also see a little bit of that spirit here throughout that course of the week with Asia Berlin Summit, that this is going into Germany as well. It's exactly this five word I was talking about. You cannot get not excited about thinking about collaboration. So uh, uh, Mr. Nike Siemens is, of course, also uh, uh, an international co company by default, founded in Berlin. Um, you're a member of the managing board and CEO of Smart Infrastructure, uh, responsible also for, for, for Siemensstadt here in, in Berlin, right? So. Uh, how how international am I? But yes, I, I, I yeah. Go there. How international so, will so that be? I, I, first, I'm, I've never been on a panel where I'm the oldest, so I've, I've, I feel this uh, to be quite quite interesting <laughs> as an experience. To be honest, I'm actually from Berlin. I was born here, but I was born here as a French person. My mother worked for the French military, and my father was German. And when I was 18, my father basically looked at me and says, "You're too French." I'm like, all right, what does it mean? He said, well, you need to be more German. I said, so how do I become more German? He says, well, three choices. Either you go to the state, you go to the church, or you go to Siemens. Choose one. <laughs> so I, I joined Siemens at the age of 18. This is what I did. And, uh, um, and at 18, not 22, I actually went around the world before I actually joined Siemens to go um, by train to see the whole world uh, on my own. 
and I went to B Beijing, and at that time there was not a lot of cars. So you're talking WeChat at my age, there was not a lot of cars, there was lots of bicycles on the roads, which is what we're trying to do here also. Um, so international, I'm half French, half German, I studied in the UK, I lived in the US, I, I had an office in Beijing. So I've been quite, quite a few times around, and what I've always seen is that these type of collaboration, especially in times of COVID, is extremely important because as people tr travel less and they see each other less, we need to make sure that this network stays um, up and active, and that's why we need to actually put the energy in to make sure that this continues virtually, but in sometimes also in the real world. So I'm very happy to be here. I'm partly international, and I'm, I'm happy to be the, the older statement on this, on this panel. <laughs> so, Sebastian, uh, how international are you? Um, so, although I was born in Germany, I did spend quite some time abroad. Um, also uh, studied in Hong Kong in 2008. Had an amazing time. And then uh, after I returned and finished my studies, I actually went to San Francisco, worked at eVentures as a VC. And um, so the, the claim to fame of eVentures is that it's pretty much uh, it's, it's one team, but with five different funds across the globe. Um, so already there we saw that there's you know, lots of innovation happening, not just in Silicon Valley, but pretty much wherever you go and how important it is to really connect those hubs and pretty much build those bridges between, between the ecosystem. Because uh, yeah, back then, so when I, when I joined eVentures, that was in uh, 2010, um, I think Silicon Valley was still pretty dominant and was um, kind of leading the charge. But you could already tell that different, you know, different ecosystems also have different special specialties and different focal areas, and uh, you saw different types of innovation happening and emerging from those different clusters. So that was definitely one thing that that uh, made a, quite an impression on me. And when I then returned to Berlin a couple of years later to start my own company, Amor Lee, in the e-commerce space, uh, I hope you sometime some of you may know it. Um, uh, if not, you... You can also say that it's a sex toy company, right? Yeah, so we pretty much, we, uh, we build a lifestyle brand around uh, anything that you need for your relationship. So uh, it's pretty much for the Vogue and Cosmopolitan type of target groups, so super high-end, and uh, if you watch ProSieben these days, uh, then during prime time, Jeremy's Next Top Model, etc., then you will probably see one of our advertisings. And we actually ended up selling the company after six years to ProSieben. Um, and we, yeah, we actually started producing in Shenzhen as well, so uh, had to go quite a lot to, to China and had a pretty similar experience to you guys um, in having been there in 2008 and then returning a couple of years later. And, and yeah, to my amazement, seeing how much that changed is, is quite, quite, uh, quite radical change. And yeah, just to wrap it off, I'm now after selling the company, to Prozeben, I now started my own venture capital fund called Visionaries Club, and we actually invest in B2B technology in Europe, but we also see lots of influence, obviously, coming from abroad. And uh, yeah, the, the special thing about the fund is that we only have smart investors who invested in the fund. So we have 15 unicorn founders uh, from all over the world, um, and lots of corporates, actually, and family businesses also investing. So Amaroli, uh, a very quiet company, but one of the best lead companies in the space. And you didn't hear a, a lot about them when they started, but they executed so well and it became really huge success. So big compliments, Sebastian, for this. And also one of the major people behind the scenes in Berlin, if you really want to get to know how uh, business is being done here. So uh, shout out for Sebastian. Uh, so if I, um, I mean, of course, we are now in times of COVID, right? So, uh, uh, oh, before, sorry, so like, Shada, how are you? Oh, well, I won't make the joke that you have to put your mute off now because I think it's us who are not, we, <laughs> I think it's us no, who are muting you. Oh, yes, there you are. Yeah, you can hear me? I can hear you. Yes, we can all hear you. Welcome. Thank you. Excited to be joining from Bangalore. Yes, I, I saw on your YouTube channel that you interviewed uh, Mr. Tata of Tata Steel, one yes. of the, the most famous entrepreneurs around the globe. How amazing that yes. was. 
you know a great opportunity and what was most exciting that he's 81 years of age and this was the first time he did webinar and there were 50000 people watching live and it was a new experience and he embraced it and did it so yeah it was quite uh, Quite an experience. Yeah, I really, really enjoyed the interview. It was a great, really great opportunity also to get to hear from himself, you know, how, how he see, looks at the world right now. So big compliment for, for you and your story, one of the most uh, well-known uh, entrepreneurial platforms in India that showcases and highlighting uh, uh, stories of Indian entrepreneurs. So also, of course, a perfect channel and platform for all kinds of innovation coming from India. Um, and, and you were also discussing India first, eh? or how should I interpret that uh, from a geopolitical point of view? You know, I think uh, it, it's a very interesting time, but also a very uh, new time uh, for India, because uh, I'm sh I don't know if you followed, but uh, there is a little bit of tension uh, from, a, you know, from a geopolitical standpoint with China right now, uh, which... Uh, we are experiencing as a country. So there is a, a, a tension on the borders uh, right now. And, and, and also the other thing is that across the world, there is a movement of, uh, towards localization. Uh, and, and it's happening here in India also, uh, which, has, which has meant that uh, Chinese firms investing in India has been, as of now, uh, been put on hold. Uh, so the Chinese investors were very active in the country uh, I, till before the pandemic, but now uh, that has been completely put to a standstill. So interesting time and also interesting because India has, as you know, 800 million smartphone users. It's a growing economy. Uh, uh, so there's this whole focus now on how do we build uh, the market by Indians for Indians. Again, a phenomena which is taking place across the world, but that's also happening very prominently here in India. Yes. And we really do miss you, Shrara, here in Berlin at, at this conference also this year because you've been around la, uh, so many times here. So, uh, But it's good, really good to see you on the screen. So welcome to you again. So, uh, Solvek, if you're listening to this, uh, the Indian market... Uh, um, not so international yet, but if you imagine like India or the other countries in, in, in Asia, what are your thoughts on that? And, and also how has COVID now maybe uh, impacted those, those ideas around uh, uh, developing your business? I think it kind of helped us to um, really push forward. So what Signals actually does is on the one hand, um, we invest in pre-seed companies. So in um, mainly SME tech, in digital health and in new mobility. So these are the areas we are strong in and we're trying to push for. And this really helped right now. Obviously, digital health is rising and gets more and more important. And, uh, and the second pillar we have is a venture client where we try to push in um, startups to work with um, Dignali Duna and to really um, create a win-win situation for both sides, for the startups and for um, Dignali Duna. And um, I'm doing this now since seven years before with Lufthansa and it's um, still a really a cultural topic, so we really are the translator in between um, those two worlds. And I think right now we are actually on a better, we have a yeah better um, starting point because they're really listening. We see like that online, that virtual, digital uh, platforms are being more accepted. So even like people who are like in the beginning said, I know we don't want to work with it. They have to kind of. So um, I think for us, it's really helping at the moment. And um, also to, to maybe show more and work on the mindset. So we're doing a lot of webinars with, um, especially in the digital health area, and we bring in a lot of experts from around the world and show like what's different. So when um, I opened up a Singa our Singapore office for Lufthansa, it was really um, like the startups were pushing us. We were doing like all the corporations and they were saying, okay, what's the bigger, bigger deal here? And I'm like, yeah, let's try, let's like have MVP and just uh, figure it out. And they were like, no, 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 what's the big vision? And I think it's really pushing us to, to look to other countries and to see like, okay, what kind of um, digital solutions we can work with our challenges right now. Yeah. So for us, it's actually a good, good yeah, time right now, to yeah. be honest. Shara, you want to respond to that? What, what, what do you see? You know, so uh, a lot of uh, uh, 
you know, a lot of tech or solutions which were being talked about now have become a reality. For example, I would say one very, very important thing which we are seeing in India, and I think there the world ha can play a role and Germany, Berlin can uh, play a significant role in some of these opportunities. One, I would say telemedicine. You know, we always talked about telemedicine as uh, something that needs to happen, but now that's happening. Because of COVID, unfortunately, it is happening. And now with, uh, you know, the infrastructure, as I said, the mobile infrastructure, the communication infrastructure in place, we saw some very interesting companies raise huge millions of dollars. And, and on an everyday basis, they're seeing thousands and thousands of patients online. And, and, and how do you use robotics, AI, machine learning to not just give a consultation, but to do testing and different things online. So I think that is an opportunity. Education is a huge opportunity. We've seen, you know, in pandemic, two companies that have become, one has become a unicorn in the last six months because they raised significant money from SoftBank, an academy. And then there is another company which raised $600 million again in the pandemic because the acceleration of people learning online has just, you know, what we are seeing in India is that it has fast forwarded uh, uh, to seven to eight years because of the pandemic. So I think the, the labyrinth of digital, which was laid in countries like India and I would say Southeast Asia and, and the big numbers that we were talking about, suddenly those big numbers are also leading to consumers who are paying and who are there. And that's why I think that poses a great opportunity for countries like Germany to see what are some of the solutions which we have, where, you know, which we could bring digitally or which we could bring online to these millions. I would say India, 800 million. If you look at Southeast Asia, another 250 million. So, you know, it's like a billion of population. Yeah, maybe sometimes I will raise my hand as in the online meeting so you know that uh, that, <laughs> that we want to also uh, ask the other people questions. But this is a great point because Mr. Sao Essig, in some regards, you could, you could say that like in a digital way, Germany is actually the emerging market instead of Asia, right? As I mentioned also in the example, I mean in certain ways that's absolutely true, unfortunately. But I think it's actually the, the combination of the, the, the heritage we have and the knowledge we have in Europe, in Germany, together with actually with, with Asia, I think this combination is the, the most valuable one. And this is also where, where we now, from a company, you know, we, we invested heavily into, into, into Asia. Actually, we just uh, last year celebrated our 30 years anniversary in, in APJ. And we started already, I think, in 1998, our lab in Bangalore. And not just as an as a extended workbench, but quite frankly, to really give product ownership and responsibility there. And I think that's the difference, how we should, should work together. And so um, absolutely, we can learn and embrace from that. And we see a lot of innovation coming from, from Asia, where we see things, movements happening, which we can then also take on a global scale, actually. Okay, so maybe elaborate a bit more on that. So internally you notice, uh, and also, but looking at Asia, like what concrete actions can you now take because of becoming more digital, maybe even as an organization from Germany to the rest of the world? Yeah, I mean, one of the things what we established around the globe is actually a vibrant uh, startup um, fund and acceleration capabilities with SAP IO. And there we even have, um, you know, accelerators in Tokyo, in Singapore, and also in Bangalore. So we really not only fund, but also help startups to grow and leverage actually the global presence of SAP. And there I can just give you one example of a company in, in Singapore, uh, Pulsify, where we work together and they basically developed an amazing integration to our HR software to fight against um, biases in the, in the hiring process. Because you know, we see the application, you need, see the CV, but quite frankly, everybody has inherent biases and we want to get rid of that. And then we combine an innovative startup with an idea with the tremendous artificial intelligence knowledge, which we see in the Asia region as well, which is now complementing our portfolio on a global scale. Mm -hmm. And these are things where we can take a lot of innovation from Asia around the world. And this is um, where we really look actively to, to partners, to ecosystem, to startups uh, to help actually. And I think that's, that's important. This openness is absolutely key. Yes. So I will not do all, all the time going from left to right, right? Because it, it gets boring if one after the other gets a question. So from now, from now on, it will become maybe even more interactive by people responding to each other on, onto the stage if you hear interesting stuff. But Mr. Nike at Siemens, what role does COVID now play in your organization? Because 
Are you allowed to travel? You, do you travel a lot? Or, or I, I think nowadays? that's, um, I did the calculation, it's the first time in more than 30 years I have not taken a plane every, uh, for three months or four months. I didn't have a jet lag, so we're not traveling. And the key thing, and I, I like what Sharma says, is I always ask, so what is the biggest digitalization accelerator? Is it the CEO or is it the CTO? And the answer is COVID, right? I mean, COVID has... We are sending 240,000 people we are allowing now to work from home. One of the oldest, 172-year, 173-year-old startup, if you want. So this acceleration, which you talked about in India, is happening also for us. We actually, things we would never have thought would be possible, we're just doing it now. You're seeing it with Zoom going from 30 million to 300 million. All of those technologies are being actually accelerated by COVID. And that's really sort of a key question we have to ask ourselves is, what has changed? I mean. You may, you, 30 years in Asia, I mean, very respectable. Um, we built, I think, 164 years ago, the first telegraph to Bombay. Uh, Siemens, as a startup, the first thing he did is he sent somebody to Asia, somebody to Russia, and somebody to England. Because he says, as a startup, I need to have a worldwide sort of reach to be able to do it. So we've been there for a long time. We've been in, in India when the Spanish flu hit, right? So we've seen the changes it does. What has changed this time is that we are an extremely integrated supply chain. And we had to put a lot of effort to keep our supply chain running because we've seen COVID start in China, move to Europe, move to the US, and then hit India. And India, it hits really, really hard. I mean, India came to complete halt for three months. Nothing really could happen in India anymore. And going through this and being still able to act in India, to act in China, has been an amazing feat which we needed to took in place. And the only way you could do it is through digitalization. So my take here is, what did we learn? Right, we, we had the Spanish flu, but we didn't have digitalization. We could react much faster because a lot of the digital capabilities we have are absolutely crucial at the foundation to have this resilience which we have. And, sorry. And an example of, of where this now leads to, like one project where you think of, okay, now because we have these 240,000 people uh, working from home and being digital, what new opportunities have now come to light? Well, we have to rethink the way we work. I mean, as Siemens, we build a lot of technology, we bought a lot of startups to bring people even closer to the office. I mean, 50% uh, or 40% of worldwide energy is being used in offices. 50% of this is being wasted. So we wanted to make it more efficient. Now, hooray, in COVID, you don't want to cram as many people as possible in the office. So we have to completely rethink how can you use the same technology which brings people together into cities, into areas, keep them apart safely. And these are the type of things which not only using technology, we need to rethink technology to actually make this adaptability and this flexibility happen. And it's important because, and you talked about uh, China is back to normal. I mean, we're growing in China, which is something which we wouldn't have thought after having been hit in sort of India still at a complete halt. So we need to see how can we apply technology to make sure that in, developed, in developing countries, we can actually make sure people are safe and are capable to continue to work in different environments. So I think COVID has accelerated not only the use of technology, but also enabled us to rethink how can we use technology to achieve something. Strada, um, I mean, I, I, must, I can imagine that, you're, that, you, that the amount of people you have on the platform now has skyrocketed since, since COVID because everybody is at home and, and, and desperately is reading your stories uh, for inspiration and, and where the, the future uh, leads to. Uh, but how about getting, getting the sponsors and the corporates on board, your, your, your business model? I mean, what does it look like with India being on a, in a lockdown now for, for so many months? You know, it's actually a, a, a very good question and very unfortunate that in the worst of the times, uh, the business, at least for your story, has been the best. Uh, and I've been running this for the last 12 years. It's not something that I feel proud to say, but, you know, I have like such a mixed feeling that in the last six months, uh, uh, we've seen the kind of growth that I haven't seen since I started your story, and it, which is more than a decade back, because India, unlike the West, unlike Europe, and unlike US, has still been predominantly a very TV and uh, print-driven market. Uh, because the newspapers have been big here, which we've seen like in US and all, everything had moved to digital. While India moved to digital, the news consumption, the information consumption still remained primarily on TV and print. But because of the last six months now, the 
you know, for us, the numbers have doubled. And, and, and people, and then what I hear in the market is that many, many people have left print. So print has gone in this country. And, and, and uh, corporates, because they are seeing that they want to be part of the innovation, they want to be part of what's new, what's the new business models that are emerging in this new post-pandemic world, have been in, engaging far more uh, effectively and a lot with us. And I think that's the uh, one key trend, I would say, what we are seeing is that large businesses and be it the American firms here, German firms uh, or from across the world and Indian large enterprises are all looking at what's next. What does this new next mean? What are the innovations happening on ground? How can we be participating in that? And that means that it has been a good uh, ground for us because we have the largest uh, engagement and database of uh, innovation in the country. So yeah, to answer your question, interesting times, uh, but I hope uh, we got these numbers without the COVID. Uh, but yeah, it has been uh, finally digital India, I feel has arrived in the last few months. Yeah, yeah. your work the last 12 years paid off, uh, unfortunately, through COVID. But I mean, I, I must imagine also what, like seeing right now what, what your platform can do and also bring for the future. Uh, with all the ideas must give you also lots of hope for for this future oh i am very hopeful about this future like i like uh, you know i i don't remember the name but uh, you know from siemens what he said is that we are today the foundation has been laid because of digital and and i also feel that the young people india is a very young country are very hopeful you know it's the toughest time we are not a rich economy the gdp has been impacted uh, by 25 uh, percent india has been on a lockdown but the hope and the kind of building that we are seeing in the country, like the young people, to bring the economy back. Because at the end of the day, the government cannot take care of the, you know, can't find all the solutions for 1.3 billion people. And I'm seeing across the country the way people are building, the way people are thinking of new solutions is very unprecedented. And, and, and I think this is here to stay. And digital is empowering. So I don't imagine a world where hope... Uh, positivity and, 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 you know, the different plannings and solutions can be built without digital. And, and, and that is what we are seeing every day here in India. Yeah, by the way, my name is Cedric. So, Sharma, nice to meet you virtually. Yeah, <laughs> but it's, Cedric, nice but, to meet but you. But these are the key things. Is as we're looking at Asia, one of the amazing things, and we talked about um, when Thomas was asked about are we a developing country in Germany or not when it comes to digital, India was, and if you look at what the Geo Network did, I mean, the, you might, um, what um, um, Ambani um, did on building a hyper, hyper speed 4G network at 10, 10 times less of the cost. Now the data, the mobile data um, penetration in, in, in India is as high as in China, and the costs are much, much lower, meaning there's more data traffic in, in all of India than, for example, in the U.S. And these are the types of infrastructure which need to happen, and you have a unique identifier also in terms of a, a personal identifier. When you have those components, then startups can build and build something which scales. Because if you need to scale because you need to take roads in India, it's going to be really, really tough, right? I mean, if you, need, if yeah. you can scale because you can use a mobile network, you can use a, a unique identifier and an e-commerce platform, then you can scale at a much a faster speed. And that's what we, we are seeing in Asia, and that makes a big, big difference. And it's important for us when we do the investments to do exactly that. Yeah. Sebastian, I saw you writing uh, while, while uh, Shada was, was talking. I think you were starting to write at the time where she says, okay, print is now really declining. You immediately came up with new business models and ideas, I think, how you're going to, with your investments, play into that? Almost. Um, I actually, I, I wrote down that I, that I wanted to mirror your sentiment, um, Sharma, and I think I also heard that from you guys, that um, as you know, Americans like to say, never miss a good crisis. I think this is the perfect time right now so uh, sorry oh all right yeah, almost American uh, so <laughs> um, or as uh, Formula One driver uh, Senna always said uh, you know you cannot overtake eight cars in sunny weather but you can when it's raining so uh, I think this optimism uh, that I can hear from India and that I can also feel here on the panel is is really an amazing outcome of this crisis and you know with with COVID being our CDO and, and also getting to change 
processes that we never thought would ever change our infrastructure or systems. I think that's that's one thing. And then the other thing that we are also seeing as a as a fund is that many industrial players now really think not only in terms of defense, but really want to start already playing offense. And what that means typically is how can we react to this new normal of not having sometimes not completely global supply chains, but also sometimes a little bit local, so a mix of global and local supply chains of uh, investing into companies like Arculus, which is one of our portfolio companies doing, doing um, uh, pretty much trying to, to make production processes even more efficient. Um, and that, that's exactly the type of investments and the type of movements that we're now seeing. And then top that off with the type of things that we talked about before this panel, that you have a completely new style of working. So you have to invest and think about those ideas that, uh, that either you know, people are going to create and that we, that we are going to invest in that make remote working adapt to you know, the, this new style of, of working and that make, for example, onboarding new employees, which is already hard when you have a physical company, but that's even more... Uh, even more important and even tougher in times of, you know, you're not, you're starting your new job, but you don't see your coworkers. You, you may meet them over Zoom, but you have never met them in person. So I think these are super interesting times and challenges. Yeah. Before I give, give uh, Sovak, um, uh, but what then, because let's talk about concrete action then. You're an investor. Uh, Shara has your story sharing Every day, multiple inspiring stories of entrepreneurs. When I look at the German publishing market, uh, where do you go to for inspiring stories on, on a daily basis? You have a couple of local blogs, you have the newspapers, but what they usually write about tech uh, is not really insightful or any good. So why don't you start a platform, your story in Germany, together with, uh, with uh, Strada, and invest in some more optimistic, positive stories about you know, what German innovation could do? Yeah, we are actually uh, actively thinking about that because uh, within our LP base, so within our funds investor base, we have those amazing unicorn stories. We have the Mittal family who invested in the fund. We have um, yeah, lots of family businesses and, and corporates that you would know which have seen so, so many tough times but still have come out on the, on the, uh, on the yeah. bright side. Yeah, of we miss so the these, stories. We miss yeah. those stories. There's really a lack of like really quality, high quality journalism on, on yeah. those kind of stories. 100% agree. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So you can do this after the, after the talk. <laughs> yes. So, so like in, in, I mean, if you look at like, is it more at, at uh, Iduna, is it more like an internal thing now, like COVID being the CDO or again, how, where will this like force you to, to also apply those things in services and, and also maybe uh, abroad. Are there some ideas that you're thinking about that you can reveal here on stage? Yeah, it's, um, I think first of our hope stories was that um, actually I joined um, during COVID. So we expanded signals and we not only have uh, two females leading signals now, but we expanded also in terms of um, much more um, money and resources. Um, and I think this shows, um, obviously, this was a choice from our real CDO, but at the same time, maybe COVID was helping him um, <laughs> to really push for that. And I think what I realize is we are not only the translator between startups and corporate at the moment, but also sometimes really when it comes to language, right? I mean, the German uh, Mittelstand still is really German. And so um, I think what we see right now is we are also changing our culture. So we are talking much more to international um, Startups, um, especially in the health sector, we see a lot from other countries which we see we can't miss the opportunity. So we have to invest. Also, they are maybe not so comparable yet to, um, to our company. And I think this is really um, helping us not only digitalization, but also inter, like to really feel like um, we have to work globally and with other partners. And this makes actually me really, really excited because uh, I think this we need in Germany much more risk taking making much more like being open and international and not only in our bubble here in Berlin. I mean, I love our bubble, but it's like, it is still a bubble. And I think we have to push that through. So um, Signa Iduna actually is 
the headquarters in Dortmund, a complete different, uh, <laughs> different life there. And um, I think to bring that in with um, young um, startups uh, from Asia, from the US, it's really um, changing a lot right now. And um, we see that our internal um, platforms we're creating right now, webinars, Zoom calls, we are not allowed, but uh, Skype calls uh, still, like in during like a couple of hours, they are booked out. So we have so many people internally who want to know about the new startups. We're presenting kind of um, every two, three months, we're presenting new startups um, internally. And we yeah. have never would have thought... But what is an idea or a startup that you're really excited about at this moment, that you're presenting toward like, the, the internal decision makers? I think I'm really excited right now about um, two startups. One I can't uh, disclose yet, and another one we just uh, did the deal with Phantasma Labs. Um, they're like a pre-seed, super young, um, two um, founders matched actually at an um, um, entrepreneur first, like an um, yeah, organization here in Berlin which really tries to bring people who are like willing to work on something but not found the right match yet together. And so they're working in um, yeah, the area of autonomous driving. And I think this is something um, I'm really excited about. So I don't understand. So the, the platform brings... Founders together no, that's, who are working. No, that's okay. where they met. Like the founder team met at Entrepreneur First. Ah, okay. But they're working on um, autonomous driving. Ah, okay. Yeah. Really? Okay. Yeah. And but how does super, how does this young. fit into the to, into the In into Zignai the trends Duna. and the? Yeah, yeah. that's yeah. Um, I mean, Signai Duna is an insurance company. We obviously know that um, it will everything will change, and especially um, I would say mobility. And if we just depend on the mobility concepts right now we will lose our business. So we have to invest now and actually find also insurance cases right now. For example, we, um, I think um, in 25 hours, we found a new insurance for Cirque, for the, like, the bikes, now Bird, um, which there was no insurer who said, like, I want to insure you. Because of, obviously, if you ask our mathematicians, they say, no, don't do it. And, um, but I think you have to try out and you have to figure out, and maybe it's not the best case in the first way, but there will come new forms of mobility and we have to be ready for that. Yeah. I think that if we all listen to the math mathematicians all the time, I heard one case about Daimler uh, uh, denying Uber or, or the investment, right? So because uh, the business case would not work, right? So it's not always the mathematicians who should be in the lead in the end. Uh, which brings me to, I think we have 25 minutes for this, and I think this is really also the aim of this panel, is listening to like, concrete cases of, of startups, of ideas that you're working on. So, uh, uh, Cedric, um, I mean... How would you say, how, how startup y or how corporate are you on a scale from, from, from one, to, one to ten? Before we listen to your concrete to ideas. It's always an unfair question. I, I said, look, I'm the oldest startup from Berlin, 173 years old. I were, we were created in a backyard when there was no garage because there were no cars here. <laughs> and since things, lots of things have happened. So um, I think somewhere in the middle between super startup and, uh, and a big old company. And, and we're trying really hard to reinvent ourselves. Um, digitalization was one of them. Most people don't know we're the 10 biggest software company in the world. We are the biggest industrial software company in the world and we did this in the last well, 10 years to be able to go into this. So we're, we're transforming ourselves consistently and continuously and people always ask why and it's because if you don't transform you're, you're going to be in trouble. So as a startup, we need to constantly sort of see what are we about. Are we, as you said, as you do now, are we about ensuring what are we about and we're fundamentally about technology. So how startup -y are we? The question is, is more the other way you should have asked is, is how should we work with startups and what do you want to do? And the key thing is there's three, th three ways which Siemens works with startups. Um, the first way, um, we could be your biggest customer, right? So if, if you're, depending on what products you have, of course, but depending on, on what sort of capabilities we have, is you rarely have a company which can scale to 385,000 people, which is doing healthcare, which is doing energy, which is doing so many different things. So that's the first one. The second one is uh, we are actually investing. We have a company called Next 47. It's an investment arm. We have a billion dollars, and we're using that billion dollars to invest in startups because we say certain things we can do internally, certain things are better on the market. And we're investing in companies in Berlin like Sender. It's like the mm. imagine it like the Uber for for um, uh, freight freight um, basically, or in Scoutbee, which is re rethinking on how to, can you do purchasing. And we're investing in it because we have a big logistics arm or because we have also um, 
one of the biggest purchasing budgets, but because also we want to see how can that technology be used. So the first one is we can be your customers. Second one, we can be your investor, or we can even buy mm -hmm. um, startups. We're buying a lot of startups every year, um, 5, 10, 20. Mm -hmm. And the last one is we can actually work together. So we can do um, joint go-to-market. So if you're a startup, the th key thing is, is you should have something which is scaling massively, and then you need an arm to actually go there, and that we, we could be that fact. So to your question between 1 and 10, we're trying to be as much 10 as we can, and we need to constantly challenge that. But we need everybody in Asia and everywhere else to help us to do this reinvent uh, reinventing. And as Solva said, it's, mm -hmm. it's not only Iduna, it's Siemens, it's SAP, it's, it's everybody which needs that help to be able to achieve that. Yeah. So, Sebastian, would, would you bring one of your teams to, to Siemens in the early phase? So, um, if it's very early, I would for mode number one. So, I think um, working together as, you know, trying to find product market fit, having or scaling your company through a very close collaboration in terms of, uh, in terms of revenues, in terms of becoming a customer. I think that makes sense. I'm a little bit more doubtful if it, if it makes sense, or I, I would personally not actually advise a, a founder to take you know, corporate money too early. I think it does make sense. I mean, the, the examples of Scout B, of Sender, etc. I mean, these are more mature companies where you already have the broad customer base and where it, it, you are as a, as a corporate, if you come in too early, I think then the chances are that, that the ownership that you'll get in the company feels a little bit too strategic almost. So I would advise to probably, if, if a corporate is interested in, in investing super early stage in, in companies and startups, then I would probably say, hey, go through an intermediary like maybe you can invest in entrepreneurs first. I don't know if that's actually possible. You can invest in funds uh, such as Visionaries Club where the purpose is to have a more neutral vehicle um, but still provide the access to those, to those two parties, to, to, the, to the startups and to the corporates, uh, but to pretty much do it in a more neutral way. And then as time progresses, then I think it does make sense to, to start thinking about strategic involvement. But yeah, I think you just have to know as a founder that it sometimes takes some options off the table in terms of exit and also sometimes in terms of potential customers. Perhaps, I mean... I uh, respectfully disagree, but uh, that's what I should do. Also. Yeah, please disagree. <laughs> please disagree. We have yeah, many I mean, more minutes. The key thing is we have different ways of, of giving money. I mean, our Next 47 is a completely separate. Um, they will only use us either as customers, etc., when we need it, and they will leave you alone so that not 385,000 people are too interested in what uh, a three- or four-man startup or women startup is actually driving for. So there's different ways of and different maturities depending on the companies on how to invest. But I actually also think, I mean, there's where most of fundamental R&D and research in the 80s, 90s was done in big companies. It's now with venture money being separated and, and, and driven out in the, in, the, uh, in the venture market. And we need to play both. We do a lot of fundamental research internally, but we do a lot of fundamental research actually with startups. And as you probably, we're very interested to get in early and understand if something is super disruptive to be part of this. Can we make sure that we don't crush uh, that startup from the beginning? That's what we need to work on. But I think we should do both. And you have a lot of experience also on your side. I, on this I think it's important that we not only think about fund, uh, funds and, and how to invest into startups. I mean, this is the one thing. I think actually also in Notions, right, how we can help startups to grow. And that's where, for instance, SAP with SAP IO, we have an accelerator program, which is actually zero equity based, which is unique because we, you know, we really want to help these startups and let them participate in the ecosystem and platform of SAP and the global scale we have. But we are not uh, interested in this regards to get, get more deep into the startup that, that they have a barrier in that one. And I think this combination of the one hand side of fund, on the other hand side, a zero, um, uh, zero equity based accelerator, this is actually, I believe, a good combination that we don't kind of pressure the, uh, the startups too much, but still embrace them. And we now have more than 100 startups in the accelerator program of SAP around the globe. And this is something where uh, I think we need to be really specific how we engage. But the upside is huge, and especially also the, the, the global reach. And I think we, we saw that now with, with digital. We talk a lot about digital. And I always do the question there, kind of how long did it take to get the analog telephony system to get 100 million users? This was 75 years. And even Facebook, 
for online took three years. And then we all know Pokemon Go, which only took two weeks to get 100 million users because it was all cloud, all mobile around the globe. And this is the, this is the size of scale you can have impact these days. And this is something where, where, should we, where we should acknowledge that every information and knowledge we see on a global scale can spread rapidly, actually. Can I, so, sorry, you go for it, Solvay, first. No, I, I also wanted to say, so our approach is um, to say, like, founders first. So because I agree, yes, we have to look at the founders, but at the same time, I sometimes wonder why everyone's saying, oh, the big corporate. Yes, I know it's slower. Yes, I know the processes. But at the same time, this is why I like it that you said, like, Siemens was a startup. At the same time, this is actually where they need to go. And there's so many startups still being, like, little and nice and being talked about in the scene, but not really really fighting for the big scaling and the, for this we need partners like the corporates and I think if we find an approach where we really feel like we're at the same eye level and we're sitting together and working together on a bigger goal so um, since be it to be like bigger in Europe, bigger for like our like really um, Berlin bubble here, so this is where we would need to work on and I don't like this always like oh don't take the corporate money take what you can get from it. There's so much more than just the money. And I think we don't have a money problem, but we definitely have a scaling problem. Yeah. And, and I think one thing what we also should think about, and that's more a little bit more macro uh, level, but how do we measure success in the future? And I think we talk a lot about um, growth in user base in, in other regions. Like in Germany, we still talk a lot about profit. And for sure, most of the startups will not be have, have an operating profit in, in place for a long time. I mean, even the, the larger, and we still call them startups in the US, which are mm -hmm. huge companies, they burn money every month, but it's okay because of their, their investor base. And I think we need to come to a point, what is success? And this is for sure different by, by, by most probably country, by industry, by, by company. But I also think we need to have different dimensions how we judge it, like even for instance, including sustainability. So this is something where we talk a lot about the top line and growth of the company. We talk about operating profits and efficiencies of company. Why not talking about the sustainability, the, the kind of introduce a green line? Which, again, we have top line, bottom line. Why not introducing green line as a dimension for success? Also for startup fundings, when startups can help corporates to reduce their carbon footprint, for instance, and what they do. And this is something where I believe we have two less conversations so far. What, what is success of a company in the future? And I believe... I feel this is changing rapidly. We talked this year in the beginning of the year in Davos a lot of, about sustainability. And I think COVID is a little bit overshadowing this discussion. But I think we all feel, and I think everybody this year recognized that the climate certainly changed in a dramatic yeah. pace nobody ever expected. Yeah. And we all need to work against that. And here also startups can help a lot. But the funny thing is, as I said, that COVID was probably the biggest uh, chief digitalization officer since ever. COVID was also the biggest proof point that actually reducing CO2 is actually feasible. It's the first time in history we reduced by more than 6% CO2 emissions. And we still are all eating and, 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 and working and being successful. So we need to take this in account because it showed us that we don't have to travel. And as we corporate guys do, we travel for a one-hour meeting to Mumbai and come back. That's completely crazy if you think about it. So we have to rethink also this way. But I wanted to say something which was super important, Thomas, what you said is, look, it took 75 years to build telephone lines because you had to put copper into the ground to connect, right? It went into 30 years for mobile. Facebook took whatever, three or four years to go to where it is because there was only PCs and there weren't any smartphones at the time when, when, when Facebook came up. And Pokemon Go is because every one of my kids could download it within a second. So in the consumer space, this happened. But there's a second revolution which is happening. And Make in India, or actually Make in China, is, is an example. Is The whole industrial world, the whole machines in the industrial world are not really connected. They're not part of an ecosystem. They're not part of a platform. And I talked to Sebastian about it. That's the new frontier. So if you have a consumer model, easy to grow, easy to go forward, the model is there, and then you have your metrics. If we go into the industrial space, we have to rethink it on, on how do we actually do it. And, that's, and, and we at Siemens, in every third machine in the world, there's a Siemens controller at the moment. But how do we get the best out of it so that actually the production capabilities are still there is really the next 
wave, which we need to define with Asia, because Asia is the manufacturing hub for the world at the moment. Yeah. What kind of story, Strata, do you see on your platform about those so successful collaborations between, for example, uh, industry companies and, 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 and startups, uh, and also in the light of sustainability? Here in Europe, we, had, we have this Green Deal. What is the situation like that in, in India? You know, I love the point, Dirk, uh, 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 which Thomas made on uh, accountability and what will be the definition of uh, success. Because India, according to this estimate, is going to be one of the worst affected countries uh, with the climate change. In fact, the statistics say that it's going to be in the top five countries which will be severely impacted. Uh, and, and, and I think as a country, we are cognizant. And again, COVID, thanks to Unfortunately, I have to say, thanks to COVID, we have also realized uh, what Cedric was saying is that we, the, the country is not that bad and it can be clean. Having said that, there is a huge focus now uh, in the country because it's about a sustainability, it's about a future and a country like India will play, you know, it will impact the world if, the, if this country also goes for a doom because of the uh, climate change. Just for everyone's benefit, because I read the number yesterday, US uh, spends $700 billion a year on a military and they spend 15 uh, billion dollars, which is very less, uh, and there's a huge debate happening on climate change. So they are going to be the second most impacted, but India is going to be the first. But anyways, coming back to this, I feel that the world, you know, the best thing, and sorry to sound a little spiritual, but the best thing about this COVID is that it has realized that we are all so connected. Besides the digital, we are all so fragile, we are all so weak, and we are also not heroes, which we think we are superheroes, which America has fed us the narrative, which we are not. And we are vulnerable, we are weak, and we are connected. And so <laughs> I feel that, uh, you know, to answer to Sebastian's question, I think we've realized that the corporates also have heart, and we've realized that startups also can be heartless <laughs> and uh, but at the same time you know the underlying connect the truth is that we're connected and we're going to see a lot of genuine collaboration because we know that there is a place of humility from which we all will have to operate and india cannot be a 1.3.5 billion country going to hell and europe will not get impacted or a europe cannot be italy cannot be uh, you know facing the worst crisis where a lot of tourists come from Asia. So, you know, we have to take care of itself. And I just think that in India, we are seeing that real realization, as Cedric said, Reliance in the last two years has acquired 27 startups, which was very unprecedented for a company like Reliance because they believe that everything they can do themselves. Uh, Shell, which is an American oil and gas company, has started, has started an accelerator here in Bangalore. And they are saying, what's the future in clean tech? And they are engaging actively with startups here Facebook is uh, very, very active in it. Of course, Facebook has to be active in India because we are a huge database country. Uh, but, you know, you name the corporates and they are engaging and we're seeing the kind of engagement which is very real and the fluff of valuations, unicorn and that jazz of, you know, <laughs> the big heroes, which I think was fed a lot from Silicon Valley has died down because, you know, we've seen all... but. See, it's all cyclical, so it's died down for now. It might just come back because Airbnb was going for listing, didn't happen. Uber's number were impacted. So, you know, what happens in U.S. affects a lot of the tech ecosystem across the world. So we're seeing a lot of somberness, and I hope it stays. But anyways, coming back to this, I feel that we will be a better world because we are all going to be impacted uh, if we don't collaborate genuinely. So the time for talking bullshit has gone and genuine collaboration has begun and I'm hoping we all do that, yeah. So th thank you, Ishrata, I I'm staying with you um, uh, uh, as a moderator. Sometimes it's hard when you're not there on the stage to, to, to keep an eye on the people who are, who are calling a remote. So I'm giving you another question because I also love uh, uh, listening to, to your uh, eloquent answers. Uh, we have 25 answers coming through Slido, so people are actually actively engaged. Uh, one of the questions for you, Strada, is are you investing in uh, startups yourself and also on the energy and sustainable uh, uh, topic? Or w would you consider also in India spending your money on that and what kind of startups would it then be? 
yeah you know i've just started investing very little little amount because uh, one of my board members is sitting in the audience angela and she knows that we've become profitable like month on month so covid has been kind so i am investing but my thing is more of impact because in india it's not just you know you look at any space in india there is so much to do healthcare education uh, clean energy and yes i am uh, uh putting little little investment but anyone who's looking at investing who's looking at raising money please get in touch because we have a very strong pool of investors now here in the country and i can connect if not invest okay and who is your board member you were talking about because we can oh, say hi uh, angela she's there she's uh yeah. angela <laughs> angela diacomo yeah very welcome here as one of shall's uh, board members um um please through brella you cannot go up to her right now but through brella you can also find angela i hope that you're also in the app angela um okay uh, another question is about education uh maybe interesting who wants to uh, answer that so how do you see the future of education will we also having some panels on, on that topic is there some of you would like to to answer through covid and digitalization um I think in Germany that's where you could ask the question if we are a development country with regards to education because digital learning is nothing where we are big in. If I see how my nephew is going to school, uh, it's embarrassing in Germany, I have to say. Uh, <laughs> and I think uh, really some other countries do well. And, and for sure education will change because I think we all need to consider multiple things first. I mean, the, the knowledge and information is changing rapidly. So also new jobs are coming, which means Continuous lifelong learning is not just a, a nice word which we say since decades, but it's the reality you need to have, which means uh, skills like to be flexible from a mindset perspective and methodologies be become way more important than how to analyze topics than to basically just learn some, some topics. I think different skills will be required, and for short, digital learning will be part of our natural habit, and we will learn in, in micro learnings in where we go to, to embrace new skill sets. And I think this is something, this will be a new norm, and this will require not only the, the entire schools and university systems to adjust, but also for corporates how to do that, because also we are all sitting here. We have a huge change in the workforce based on all the new technology, on the new things what we drive, mm -hmm. uh, to take the employees with us, because that's our most important obligation, actually, to take everybody with us along the journey. And that's what we uh, want to do, and that's the reason why we where we invest significantly into knowledge and education uh, because that's, that, will is, that will be the future success of a company. I mean, I, I want to defend a bit Germany for a second. I mean, um, both Thomas and myself um, did a dual vocational training, right? So something which Germany is very strong, and it's important where part of, the, uh, part of your work is in the, uh, in the industry, part is in, in a university or in a school. And this dual vocational training, especially in Asia, is extremely important so you don't have the digital have and the digital have nots which means that 10 or 20% are have no programming languages, they're gonna be fine, and 80% actually don't know if they're gonna be replaced by robots, either AI robots or physical robots. So we need to find something to take the whole population with us, and we as Siemens spend 500 million a year on retraining and reskilling our people. So we need to make sure that we're training everybody, and we need to make sure that we continuously train them, and then a lot of digital tools are enabling to do this, but. As when I go to Asia, that's the number one question I get is, I have a super young population in India, in, in Indonesia, in, in the Philippines. How do I make sure that everybody can come with me into this new digital age and it's not being sort of separated? Because then you have very difficult um, social unrest if you separate, um, uh, separate um, the capabilities because you will not have truck drivers anymore in the future. So you will not have a lot of the sort of factory workers in that form anymore. And you still need to provide jobs for everyone. And that's why your question is, yeah. is a big one. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> you agree. That's good. <laughs> you want to add? Shada? Sorry. You know, I cannot not, like I fully agree with Cedric. And in fact, I wanted to urge all of you uh, uh, you know, Cedric, Thomas, Sebastian, all of you. And uh, yeah, solving, if I get her name right, is that, you know, India has, we have the maximum number of engineers uh, who are graduating every year, but India on every year will need 10 million jobs. So we have very smart young people, but 
today the skill as thomas said you know ai today the maximum jobs that in india the startups and people require is in ai now how do you train these engineers smart engineers to new skills to new opportunities and i think there is so much one you know the collaboration between germany and india can uh, go a long way in creating skilled from you know trained educated to skilled workforce and i see that as a huge opportunity between uh, asia and uh, uh, yeah berlin yeah okay thank you uh, sebastian last question for all of you uh, start with you uh, what's your idea of of the future uh, of the collaboration uh, between asia and and berlin or or, or europe do you do you also think that you know investing yourself and that that would be possible for you to invest directly into an asian team or will you because you know as an investor you want to be near right At, within one or two hours flight maybe uh, but now through covid and you cannot even travel uh, do, do you think that there will be also more direct investment from from private investors into asian companies so what we've seen is for sure that it's possible to do deals without even meeting the team. So we've done a couple of deals pretty much over Zoom. Um, the, obviously, that means you have to check even better the references. You, uh, you have to do a little bit you know, additional work uh, that, is, that kind of falls in the place of otherwise just meeting somebody, getting a feeling for somebody. Um, so I think theoretically it's possible. Um, with our fund specifically, we, we did say, hey, we actually we do want to focus on Europe, and, and we believe, as all of us, we're former entrepreneurs, so uh, focus or fail is very important for us, and we do want to focus instead of um, failing. So we said our focus right now is Europe, but we see so much influence coming from Asia. We see teams that are partially based in Asia. Um, so that is definitely something that we see, and... Uh, overall, but with me, with investing in a European company, you, you mean a legal entity based yeah, then in Europe, in, based, in that regard. based in Europe, okay. yeah. Okay. Um, but overall, what we do see, and uh, I think Cedric you, Cedric, you already started to touch upon this. So, where I feel the collaboration between corporates and startups is so valuable, is especially in uncovering these potentials of the value chain of um, how how do corporates, what are the specific issues that corporates have and that startups can solve. So I think that's a, such an interesting treasure trove that uh, where especially Europe and also Asia have such a big advantage over, let's say, for even potentially Silicon Valley, where Silicon Valley has a very strong DNA in product, so B2C-driven products, whereas I feel Asia and Europe could use this opportunity to really disrupt the industrial value chain and, and to pretty much look at every single process step and kind of either revolutionize it or support kind of the, the new mode of working in those, uh, in those different steps of the value chain. Yeah. Fantastic. So, Vaik, um, the, the, the future when it comes to your product development and, and ideas of Asia, Berlin... I hope uh, that in the future we will be a little bit uh, more risk taker also in the insurance uh, area where you <laughs> shouldn't be too risky at some point. Um, but to really um, be open to, I think from the investment um, standpoint, I would agree um, that we will be mostly, I think, in the next future European based. Um, but to really... Um, look for collaborations, be open for it, try it out, be not afraid to fail. And I think this is the biggest problem still with corporates. They are still so afraid of failing that we um, see so many opportunities we just let slide because we, we are afraid. And I think this crisis can help us to say like, okay, there's so many obstacles we can't really control. Let's um, be, be more open for our daily business to um, maybe fail um, at some point, but then get up and uh, try the next one. And I think this is something where I definitely push for in my company. Yeah. Thomas and Cedric, uh, cl some closing remarks, um, remarks from your end, because probably I've forgotten some questions that uh, your teams have prepared so well. So maybe I've left out stuff. It's important <laughs> that you mention all those things. <laughs> no, no problem. I think 
I think I want to <laughs> add to, to one of the, the topics which was mentioned today. I'm an optimist by nature, and I also believe that we all get stronger out of this crisis which we see if we all stay together. And I think the solidarity which we see around the globe is unmatched, and that gives me confidence. And that's also the reason why we will certainly continue to invest into the relationships in Asia, which we have, we continue to invest into the startup accelerators, which we did there, for instance, into the workforce we have there. And I believe, especially the, the combination of Asia with, with all the new uh, technology and AI, which, which we see there on the rise, and the combination of our innovation up in Berlin to bridge the gap between Asia, uh, Berlin summit, I think this will be super strong and even more important than ever, also in the future. So I'm really excited about it, and I believe. Um, we need to continue that, and we need to continue to also, um, as, uh, as she mentioned rightfully, the world is just coming closer together, even if we feel differently with the current travel restriction, but I feel from a, from a feeling perspective, at least I personally feel that we are getting closer together, which is good, and I think if we all stand together, yeah. we will see a prosperous future around the globe. Yeah, when I was still working for a Silicon Valley company, I always said there's three things which are changing the world. One is technology, one is business models, and one is Asia. 60% um, of the world population is in Asia. Um, young population, aspiring population, you see it also in investing population. 43% of all, all uh, unicorns we talked about is in Asia, uh, 47 in the US and the rest in Europe. So we will definitely will invest and we ha are investing in Asia heavily because that's where a lot of the future of the world will be defined. Remember that Somebody, we talked about green, and I don't want to f forget the aspect of green. Somebody in New York uses 24 times more energy than somebody in Mumbai, on average. So that means that if everybody wants the same living standard, we need to do this. And this is where Europe and this is where Berlin comes into play. We have a lot of technology, industrial technology, infrastructure technology, which is going to be crucial to, to have that battle. And I think that we at Siemens, SAP, uh, um, and insurance or in the investments need to take the technology, and that's why this bridge is so important. Because no one will be able, uh, Sharma, you said on your own, nobody will be able to do it on their own. We can only do it by collaborating, and that's why we need to make sure that even if people are actually retracting, they're closing borders, it's, uh, it's where we're, we're practicing social distancing, which I think is a horrible world. I think physical distancing is better than social distancing. We need to come closer yeah. together to be solving those elements, and I think that's super important. Okay. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Srada, for, for joining us. Um, uh, we are with you in spirit, so uh, <laughs> uh, greetings to Bangalore. So what are you going to do the rest of your day now? Me? Yeah. I will just keep, whole day I keep talking to people and listening to their stories. So I'm going to do, and to people are more excited to tell their stories now. But listen, Dirk, I have to thank Reiner who has put this conference and the team which has put the Asia Berlin Summit despite all the challenges this year uh, and, and, and special congratulations to him. You know, I love Berlin. I love this conference and, uh, and I want to give uh, a big congratulations to him and the team for putting this conference together despite of all the challenges. Yeah. And I'm sure Raina would be smiling and feeling very happy right now, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, with a great rebranding of Asia Berlin. It's so cool that you were also uh, on this panel. And also big thanks to Sebastian, to Cedric, to Thomas, and to you, Solveig. So give it up for our panelists, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much.